Welcome to Contextual Electronics. My name is Chris Gamble, and this is the third podcast for the Contextual Electronics podcast. Today is going to be a little bit different than the past two. In the past two, we talked to Sophie Wong, who is an artist and maker. And then we talked to Stephen Hawes, who is doing a DIY pick and place, also kind of uh, building stuff up from the, from the ground up. And bo uh, both are kind of integrating uh, mechanical and software and hardware. And that is a lot of the a lot of the things that we're going to be doing in Contextual Electronics Podcast is talking to people that are outside the, the sphere of electronics, not necessarily, you know, 30-year experts in just one area of electronics like I do over on the Amp Hour, but more well-rounded and people doing things kind of all over the place but using electronics in their work. Today is going to be a little different in that I am talking to an expert, and this is because uh, this is uh, a coworker of mine, a former coworker at a job, and then a, a fellow consultant who I've worked with since, Eric Larson. And that's Eric Larson, the firmware engineer, not Eric Larson, the author. Uh, and we have worked together on uh, interesting projects. Eric's specialty is firmware, and I usually am doing hardware, and that's the case uh, with all the projects we've done together. I've been doing more firmware lately, and Eric has been a great reference for this. Eric is also a uh, really wonderful reviewer of my work and so today's episode is about c using a coworker or using a, a friend or anyone else to, to go and review your work uh, before you put it out into the world and this is actually because today he's going to help me be reviewing the advanced bluetooth cellular project which is the latest the latest project course from contextual electronics we are designing a, a small raspberry pi hat with a center part that breaks out and then the center part has a cellular modem, it's got a Bluetooth chip and a microcontroller. So it can do low power, it can do cellular, it can do Bluetooth, it can do all the other modes that the NRF 52840 can do. And then it also has battery charging and all the interface necessary to then squish it together with a sand as a sandwich with another board that is, can be custom designed to have any function on it. And so the idea is basically making a development platform that can be used over and over and over again to design electronics that have Bluetooth and cellular integrated in them in a relatively small package, about 35 by 40 millimeters. Anyways, uh, this is all to say that we're going to be going over some schematic stuff today, so that's a little bit different. I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, and this is why I'm excited about video. Now, of course, if you're just listening here, it's going to be a little bit harder to uh, follow along uh, because there will be some referencing to some of the stuff that's on the screen. There will actually be a schematic on the screen. We're going to try our best to explain things, but if necessary, I would recommend, if you're listening to this, to go and check out the video version at some point as well to get a better clue of kind of what we're looking at here. So here is the episode with Eric Larson, uh, the third podcast in the uh, the first release of the Contextual Electronics podcast. We're doing that because if you are so inclined, after three episodes, we wanted to have you to have a, a full view of all three episodes. We are hoping that people are willing to go and give iTunes reviews or tell their friends about it uh, right up front because that really helps to spread the word and make this a bigger thing and get the word out about the Contextual Electronics Podcast. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Eric Larson, firmware engineer extraordinaire and a friend of mine from work in the past. Wow. Uh, I guess we met at Hologram, mm -hmm. a little startup in Chicago there that does uh, cellular connectivity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I had been one of the first, let's see, I was probably the fifth, I think, employee oh. uh -huh. there. I would really originally started there as a contractor. They, uh, they were trying to do uh, a Kickstarter with uh, some hardware and they had one guy who was doing like all the hardware and software design for this uh, dev board they were calling the Dash, and uh, he he was uh, he was a little overwhelmed with doing all of that because <laughs> it right. it was quite it was pretty it's ambitious, and, right? 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 Like, yes. Yeah, the Dash two microcontrollers. Cool... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And one was like based off the Teensy too, and that's like not a small micro. And yeah, it was kind of the I think the original idea was a Teensy with a modem on it, and then it kind of grew to be like well let's make this like a all things to all people kind of a dev platform mm -hmm. and of course so complex as, hard, to go, as so hardware like, wants wants to do you know like uh yes yeah. and it, yeah. and then you know it's then after when you have the hardware it's just software so mm -hmm. yeah no problem just just write that software 
Right, so right, that, right. That's, so, that's the stage they were at. Yeah, right. Well, and when I came in, I, I met you, obviously, when I, I started there much later. Um, and I would come to you, I was doing like developer relation stuff and trying to get people to use the dash and other hardware that was there. But one of the interesting tasks was you basically had to d take the dash then and then make it also Arduino compatible, because you're trying to bring people in that are beginners and or, you know, people that are just trying to stand something up quickly. And that's got its own set of challenges of just playing into that ecosystem then. Yeah, had uh, we I known that that was kind of the original intent, we probably would have made some different hardware design choices because mm -hmm. the microcontrollers that we picked did not have uh, Arduino ports even really attempted. Uh, well, the Teensy was probably the closest, but it yeah. was the, the microcontroller they chose um, wasn't even didn't uh, Freescale didn't even have all of the drivers for that version oh, wow. of it. Wow. It was kind of a, a one off because it had extra flash. And so I ended up having to write all kinds of drivers just for the chip itself. And then all the Arduino compatibility. Yeah, I had to, yeah. I had to port all those drivers to, to make it match up to what the Arduino APIs looked like at a, yeah. at a low level. Yeah, and so a lot of people that are listening or watching this are probably, you know, maybe closer to the beginning of their journey. And so they probably are are uh, familiar with an Arduino, right? It just kind of feels like this thing like, hey, analog input or digital output or, you know, you basically you set, you know, you have these set functions and it does a thing. But I remember the first time I started looking at like what's underneath and it's like, oh, wow, there's a lot of, you know, each each micro that's supported, it's got its own set of stuff underneath there. Like there's whole blocks of code that are kind of, taking this genericized IDE, like the Arduino style code, that then every variation that, that is compatible with it has to then take what the input is or output is and, and basically uh, convert that to be compatible with the actual microcontroller itself. Yeah, so if you just, if you just think about turning on an LED, which from Arduino, writing a sketch is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. uh, that API is, you know, like, digital out equals one or something, you know, yeah. I, don't, I don't remember the details, but it's been, yeah, been under, a while, huh? underneath. <laughs> yeah, it, it has. But, um, the um, Arduino is originally written uh, for AT, meg, AT, Atmel AT yeah, yeah. chips, Mega 328, yep, yep. eight bit microcontrollers, um, kind of their own design instruction set. And then as it got more popular, it's like, well, can we use Arduino on all these different ones. So yeah. what we were using was a 32-bit ARM Cortex-M from Freescale, which yeah. is a completely different architecture, even though they're, they both do the same things. So you right. have to set up, you know, how do you access the GPIO ports? Well, that's completely different. Uh, you know, how do you turn them on or turn them off? So you have to have all those layers underneath that talk to the hardware and then present the same API at the top level. So, yeah. That, yeah, and it's, that, I mean, it's, just... yeah, it's a benefit for the users, right, of course, but then the people that are doing that port have to kind of do all the in between the glue code and all the making sure it tests properly and it behaves the same, basically. Yeah, and for the most part, you can get the API to, to match up um, pretty easily uh, once you once you do all the low level work. Uh, but one of the good things about Arduino is all the libraries that are available that do, you know, different peripheral access, different devices, and you just, you know, download this library, plug it in, and it works. Well, it depends on how those libraries are written. If yeah. a lot of them are, oh, well, this is how the AT Mega works. So we'll, we're, we're writing the, the driver to that. And sometimes uh, those libraries don't, don't work the same. So you have to like write a compatibility layer in between there to get those, th those to work. Yeah. Well, how did you, how did you learn all this stuff? What is your background? Uh, so I originally started in aerospace doing SATCOM products. So, um, for, uh, large passenger jets. So, uh, let's see, the first one I worked on was in Marsat system. So it's a geostationary, uh, bent pipe design satellite system which was originally for maritime in Marsat. Uh, so ships could uh, have super, you know, fast data rates of like, 
you know, two, 200 bits per second or, you know, <laughs> something uh, really <laughs> right, cutting they edge. They basically say where they are in yeah. the, in the waters between, you know, the China and the yes. U S or something like that. Right. Yeah. The idea of, you know, getting Netflix, uh, was, was not even a, a thought <laughs> at that time. It was just, a Hey, here's my position data and 200 uh, bits per second. I'm sure that, that'll work. Um, so that got adapted then for uh, airline usage. So you put this giant honking antenna on top of a 747, and uh, you can make you can make phone calls. That was back when you can make phone calls in airplanes too. Oh yeah. Before mm. people realized that was, yeah. You remember the and only those twelve CPAC bucks a minute, phones? right? It's such a such a good deal, you know. <laughs> yeah. Now most of those I don't think were those satellite. Those were uh, plane to ground stations. Oh, they direct. were like okay, uh, yeah. But. Once you get out over the ocean, you have to use satellite. So mm -hmm. th that's kind of where that came in. Mm -hmm. And then I also worked on uh, later an Inmar or a uh, Iridium based project. And I guess Iridium's claim to fame, dis despite being a, a really good uh, book around the disaster that was uh, the business oh, yeah. case of Iridium. Yeah, that's the, but uh, the technically it's is the, the book. Yeah. 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 Great. Well, great one to check out if you're uh, interested in, in that kind of stuff. Yeah. It was a good book. Uh, but, uh, uh, they had they offered uh, polar coverage, so if you think about great circle routes, you're going from you know Europe to North America or Australia or whatever. Uh, you're you're probably flying over the pole or close to it at, at some point, and the geostationary satellites have no coverage there, so mm -hmm. you're kind of in a, this uh, blackout area of no no coverage, and uh, so that, that was the kind of Iridium claim to fame there. So mm -hmm. I worked on that and did kind of the same thing. So. That's great. And but that, so, that was a great environment to kind of grow up in as far as a software developer. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, I'm uh, sure there's tons worked... of challenges there, right? Of just not speed. What's well, but... regulated? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So the, the environment, the environment, it's regulated. So you have to document everything you're, you're doing this, you know, uh, very much water flow process of we have to write all the, this is what we're going to do before you even get started. You have to write yeah. pages and volumes of documentation. And then, uh, we actually worked with a, a global team before, you know, now it's, that's kind of common, but then we had uh, testers in Russia, another development team in London. Um, and uh, the, the guys in London kind of were the primary and we were kind of secondary in, in Arizona. And then, uh, but our, our main uh, interface was a uh, terminal connection to a VAX running in London. So that's where <laughs> I did, I did uh, all my, yeah. Programming over that into the, onto the VAX and uh, documentation in like a, te a textual uh, uh, word processor program, but we had like a, a custom developed uh, version control system. So all that kind of stuff of you know checking your code, pr prove that you test your code, prove that it works. Mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of hammered into my head from an early you know, start, especially if. Uh, you check in code that breaks the build and you leave for the day. The guys in London come in, in the morning and they can't do anything. And then you get, when you come in the next day, you get screamed at for a half an hour. So yeah, I believe you that. learn, Oh, I better yeah. check it. I better test my code before I check it in. So yeah. yeah that was do you a good find yourself, start. I have to imagine with the Vax and all that, all those constraints you just said, you're not uttering the, uh, the good old days very often. You're not, <laughs> you're not talking about that as much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look at, I mean, even at the time, and this was like about year 2000, um, at that time, it was you know archaic, right? Yeah, and, yeah, that's uh, true. Yeah, and now it seems like a whole different. You know, I feel like the guys that were there are saying, "Well, we used to do punch cards," which I couldn't even imagine how that would yeah. work to do. Yeah, to do punch cards. So, yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, um, so you and I ended up working together at Hologram, and that was great. Um, and then uh, we started consulting together as well for a project. Um, and we probably can't talk too much about the details of that other than to say it was also cellular and um, and we enjoyed working on that together. But that was that was a, a, cool, yeah. a cool project. And one thing that I've always appreciated about working with you is, <laughs> well, I appreciate it after the fact, not in the moment. I'm always like, gosh, why? Ah, I forgot to talk to Eric. Uh, and so we're going <laughs> to do that here. We're, this is so this is airing yes. live. This is my dirty laundry. Uh, maybe our joint dirty laundry here of uh, I've been working on a design and and this follows the same pattern that we had in the past where it would be get to a certain point and you should really check it with, you know, 
a firmware friend or the person that's working on firmware with you because boy oh boy it's not only is it good to always have a second set of eyes on it uh, but there's certain things that you see that I just you know I just don't think about and uh, and this has been a, a repeated pattern and so I was like okay well we should catch this on camera of like me and Eric talking about uh, this project that I've been you know designing the hardware for and we've talked about working on together uh, as a you know, as a uh, lead generation tool for our respective consulting businesses and stuff like that. And actually, I've been recording all of it for Contextual Electronics. So that's been interesting too. people that are watching this or listening to this can go and sign up for the course if they're interested. But I'm actually at the point where it lines up perfectly to talk about some of the things that um, that I should be checking into, right? So uh, what are some of the things that you've caught before that I have completely gapped on? Maybe we should talk about that first. Well, I mean, I've done a lot as far as, because mostly what I do is the embedded firmware, like we were talking mm -hmm. about. Um, I don't really do the hardware design, but I'll at least go through and um, double check designs, like layouts, make sure, you know, p pins are connected, things make sense um, as part of my, I, and I, I kind of learned that early on that if you just get handed, okay, here's what it is. Uh, sometimes there, your life gets really difficult, <laughs> right. or we find out things like, oh, well, we can't actually do that feature the way it's the way it's wired up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So one of the things is like just pin selection on a microcontroller. Mm -hmm. Some some are very versatile, like the um, the Nordic chips. For the most part, you can set any pin to any function, which is would makes your life can make your life really easy. A lot of other ones have, like, if you want a UART or I2C, well, you got this pin or that pin, and that's it. Those are the only mm -hmm. ones you can choose from. And uh, so it's it's kind of a balancing act because I can't I could go through the data sheet and say, okay, here's all your pins. These are the ones we should use. And then uh, you you take that and you go to lay it out and, and realize, well, this pin's on this side of the board and this pin's on that side yeah, of the board. I don't yeah. have to use uh, 12, 12 vias and eight layers to get right, to do yeah. this I2C bus. That's yeah. probably not going to work. So so it's right. kind of it's got to be a back and forth of, all right, well, here's some here's some you can choose from. These are the things that are really important. This pin needs to be here. So let's work around that. And then other ones I'm flexible on. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think the UART's a good example. So we had a, another example where there was two UARTs on board and uh, I was like, all right, I'll just choose one of them. And I didn't talk to you. And then it actually turned out that only one of them was capable of doing a bootloader. And so could you explain what a bootloader is for people that don't understand what that is? Okay. So um, when you get a blank board with a, a microcontroller, it has no code on it, so it doesn't do anything. So for the Either the first time you you load it, or you want to do infield upgrades, you need to, uh, to have a way for the chip to update itself. And um, a lot of them, and like the one we were talking about, have a uh, piece of ROM uh, in the chip that does a bootloader function, where it will take data from some kind of interface and then write its that data, write that program to its own flash. Um, that, that is really handy when, um, you're doing, uh, infield up, updates, which everybody wants to be able to do, especially, you know, new features, but also, you know, we, you hear about all the different security concerns all the time of, oh, this need, this stack has a vulnerability. We got to patch this. So yeah, yeah. you, you don't want to lock yourself out of being able to, to update your product easily. Yeah. Well, and even um, like, uh, so like to go back to the Arduino example before, right? Like a lot of Arduino boards are actually using a USB to serial and it's actually programming it over the serial through the bootloader in that chip's ROM and, and doing the process like that. It's only when people brick it, then they realize, oh, there's some other way to program this board that I have to go and access then that I can't get through the, the serial bootloader. Yeah, so um, so a lot of times the, some chips will have a ROM program that, that will do that for you. Uh, a lot of them don't. And so uh, that's a lot of what I've done over the, you know, my consulting career is we need to be able to add, update this code. And so I basically will write a section of a code that is a bootloader, which will run. It's like a pre-program kind of, um, kind of like, you know, same concept of a U-boot in Linux. So this runs first. Uh, it checks to see, all right, are we going to do an update? If not, it just goes, then it just uh, transparently goes to the main application. 
Um, otherwise, it'll stay in there and, and look for you know the update program coming in, reprogram it, and um, reset. Uh, but the thing about microcontrollers is uh, you ha you can't write to the same place you're reading from, at least in Flash, the way Flash works. is usually you have to erase a huge chunk of it to be able to write any of it. And so you have to have your uh, microcontroller memory either segmented either by your design or by using a separate ROM bootloader. Mm. So that's kind of the challenges as far as, you know, you can't just hit, hit an update button and reprogram itself. Right. Right. If there is an update button, someone has put it there, and it might have been you. <laughs> yeah, all the all this is happening underneath the covers, and you don't see it. And hopefully, it works, and hopefully, you don't turn off the power in the middle, and yeah. and it uh, it gets it gets zapped. But yeah, uh, there yeah. are ways around that too if if you're uh, if you're careful. So yep, yep, yeah. And so the pin assignment stuff is another one you mentioned, and uh, that's been an interesting one where. Uh, you know, certain functions internally. So you'd mentioned the NRF52. We'll actually be talking about that chip here because that's actually on this design that we're going to be talking about. But um, other ones where, you know, maybe it's not the wrong UART or whatever, but it's, hey, this pin has to be, you know, it might show that it's capable of being a reset and a chip select, but hey, we need the reset. So you can't use it as a chip select or, or something like that. You know, it's kind of a, they give you the either or, but you have to really kind of put a matrix together and and say all of the different things that could be happening and then choose which functions you're actually using and then kind of pull those out. And, and like you said, prioritizing seems like, seems like that's kind of the, the best method you, you've kind of come up with too. Yeah. You really have to figure out, okay, what are, what are my constraints as far as what are, what do I care about? Like if I need analog inputs, usually a chip has multiple analog inputs to choose from. Like if it has a analog to digital converter, peripheral in the chip it has multiple pins you could choose from so yes you have some flexibility there but not all the pins are analog capable so you have to like kind of reserve those if you know you're going to have some analog functionality you know especially now or and then when you talk about oh we may want to add stuff later to this design and not have to rewrite all the firmware to for a new for a new board well you got to kind of figure out, all right, well, which things do I need to reserve? What things might we use in the future? So, so there's, there's a lot of prioritization and uh, yeah, optimization that you can do. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Well, let's take a quick look at, so uh, the way we're going to do this, because this is a video and maybe some people listening over audio, we're going to look at the, the schematic here. I'm going to share my screen and then uh, uh, I'm going to try and explain kind of what's going on as well as we go through it. And then we'll kind of talk through some of the considerations that, Eric comes up with, and uh, we might pull up data sheets and other fun things like that. Uh, it seems like data sheets are also another important thing to to really dig into. What what is your usual uh, method when you're starting to to look through a data sheet for a particular chip? So yeah, the data sheet is really the first place you you start when you're trying to figure out all right, what do I need? So you have a list of kind of your needs. I know I need so many of this port, so many of that port, and that. That's where you start, and you think, okay, if you, once you find a chip, you think, all right, this is going to meet what we need for this design. Then you start going through, all right, how is this laid out? Uh, maybe it can do two I2C ports, and it can do two SPI ports, but not off, but not four. You can only, you know, mix and match. Mm. How's that work? You know, uh, how many analog inputs? How many digital inputs? Uh, so, so you you just go back to that prioritization thing. And then um, a lot of times uh, you f you focus on a ch when, when choosing a chip. Yeah, that's a great point the, too. What's the underlying What's the underlying architecture, um, and what are you most familiar with? What are you most comfortable with? So, I've done most of my work with ARM Cortex M, and that those have lots of different vendors. So there's lots of different parts available, whether it's from ST, Micro, TI, um, NXP. There's a lot of different vendors, so you got a lot of different choices for ARM, and there's a lot of different ones. But the core of the ARM processor is the same no matter who the vendors are, but they have their own peripherals. So um, there's something like, called a SysTick that's built into the ARM Cortex-M. So it's basically just a counter. So you could use it as like your system clock counter. Mm -hmm. um, 
but the UART peripheral on an ST micro, the re- how the registers are laid out is completely different than like an NXP, even though they're both ARM Cortex in. Hmm. And so you're saying that the so you feel comfortable being in this system, but then you have to uh, go and figure out what the what the actions are going to be to to customize it to the specific chipset, and the, like you said, the peripherals might be all different and talking talking to the different buses and things like that. Yeah. So so really, um, most of the vendors will have a, a drivers that they'll release with their chips. They'll have a development environment where you don't have to uh, write at the register level. So so like for a UART in particular. We can talk about that. Um, mm-hmm. When you want to get a day, uh, a byte from the UART, there's a uh, memory mapped regist- hardware address that means uh, that you read that and that pulls the, the byte out of the, the UART. That's how you mm-hmm. receive it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but so, so, so let's say like ST Micro or NXP, they'll have a driver that will kind of kind of like the Arduino does where you can call a, a function that will do that register read. And so you don't need to know like, okay, well I need to look and see what, what's the actual num- value of that register. So mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. is kind of, kind of works at a higher layer. Um, there are times though, when you want to, you know, sometimes those drivers are written f- to be able to cover all in all situations. And mm-hmm. you want to, especially if you want to do something in like an interrupt, you need to, you need to, Type code, and you want to know how like how many instructions are, are going to execute. Uh, you you can always go down to that register level and right. Yeah, so it's about choosing like how, how much they're giving you, like how much the high level code they're giving you, how much you have to dig in. Kind of like you said, it's like under the covers, under the hood of like how much are you customizing it and really, really you know specializing for that chipset versus using this kind of high level code that allows you to uh, to make. It's not really ever reuse it, but at least at least make it a little bit more readable or understandable or gen, uh, generic, like you said, to to do different functions. Right. Right. Okay. Great. Well, let's take a look at this uh, schematic that I have. So this is that's me. There's a schematic. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is the schematic that we have that I've been working on. Um, and here's the. Let me pull up the board, I suppose, as well. Um, so this is the uh, this is the 3D model of it. It is a Raspberry Pi hat. Um, so people that are not viewing it right now, uh, it's basically the same shape as a Raspberry Pi hat. In the middle, there's a breakaway section that allows you to break away just the cellular and Bluetooth. So this has a NRF52 on it, which is a small black chip in the lower left corner here. The uh, cellular module is either EG91 or BG95 from Quicktel. And that allows you to either be cat one or cat M one. And there will be links in the show to, uh, to each of these and what those mean. Uh, I know that that, that could be confusing if people are, are new here. And then there's a uh, USB C to talk to the NRF 52 and then a bunch of power handling. And, uh, in order to do that SIM card reader, SD card reader, uh, this is some level translation here and, uh, and then an expansion header. And this is kind of the whole thing that basically it has these uh, mounting posts here. So it has mounting posts that are kind of soldered into the board naturally. And then the whole thing kind of sandwiches together and allows you to make basically a little sandwich with a, you know, the cellular Bluetooth section on the bottom. And then on the the top piece of quote unquote bread, uh, you can kind of design in whatever you want. And it has a flexible amount of uh, IO that you can talk to it with. So like I mentioned at the beginning, this is a, this is a board that I've been showing how to build on contextualelectronics.com. Uh, Eric and I have talked about, you know, working on this together on the firmware side as well. And, uh, and this is, you know, we kind of came up with the idea together. And then this is genericized enough that I can use this for basically any hardware project I need. I just need to go and make a different daughter card for it. And daughter card being like a, you know, just a name for a generic uh, board that plugs into this motherboard. So daughter card, motherboard, that kind of idea. Uh, and so Eric, you, you've seen Similar these parts before NRF fifty two. You've worked with the uh, BG ninety six before, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So um, any so you had mentioned the uh, the flexibility NRF fifty two. Any other thoughts about the chip itself and you know things to kind of uh, keep in mind for people that are are not uh, not familiar with it? Uh, so the NRF fifty two, 
the kind of the main feature there is the Bluetooth integration. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the nice thing about that is it's got a separate core that runs the Bluetooth functionality on that one. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? That's right. Yeah. I yeah. think that's, I think that's yeah, right. Yeah. So it's got, yeah. the, they call them soft devices, I believe. So you basically, you, um, I think you just implement this code. You kind of like download the code. It's like a binary blob. At least that's the old way to do it. I think they have new ways that they're pulling in Zephyr and a bunch of weirdness. But the old way was like you put in like a, you have kind of like a preset software blob and then you just kind of throw data into it and it puts data back out and it's all magic, Yeah. Right? So when you work with those, <laughs> yeah, when you work those soft devices, though, um, that's their Bluetooth stack. And mm -hmm. you only get those in binary instead of the source because that's yeah. their secret sauce. And that, mm -hmm. but that's how they deliver it. And um, so you have to really kind of work within the constraints and rules of how that soft device works. Like so, so you're not you're not able to work at the lo lowest level like you are in most other microcontrollers if you're using mm -hmm. that soft device. So you, yeah. that's one of the things you really have to be kind of uh, careful about is to follow like what they say as far as how do interrupts work. So a lot of times those are managed by the soft device and you kind of mm -hmm. get just told that there's been an interrupt you need to handle it, <laughs> it kind of bubbles up. So so it's kind of like a, a, a kernel running underneath and you're writing an application on top of that kernel as opposed to doing the entire system yourself on a, on a bare metal system. So yeah. those kind of things, so that's what a little bit different as far as those Nordic devices. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, so again, people coming in from maybe the Arduino world, uh, you know, they're used to doing very well relatively low level stuff right because they're just kind of you know peeking and poking registers and outputting and just handling things you're basically saying now this is like having another micro on top of that micro pretty much that's kind of the idea right it's like nested so they, nested russian dolls of micros yeah they, <laughs> they kind of give you a, an api of uh to, to call instead of doing the direct hardware access yeah so it's right. kind of managed for you yeah. because they want to prioritize uh, the radio functions and you know there's a lot of time constraints as far as you know when the uh, transmit and receive actions need to happen and uh, so you kind of you're kind of second class is on mm -hmm. at, at that point <laughs> right but with the benefit yeah. being that you get you get bluetooth you get uh, ant or whatever all the different things that they put on there they have different uh, radio types and, it's and you managed, have to think about it it's managed yeah. for you yeah yeah exactly yeah right yeah so if we look at the schematic um so this is uh if people don't know this uh so the schematic we're looking at here this is all built in KiCad, as in as are all things in contextual electronics uh and so basically i've hooked up a bunch of uh a bunch of different signals here at the top section there's a bunch of power handling because the nrf52 actually has oh i should actually have the schematic up here um uh, NRF52 has internal DC to DC and linear regulators. So basically it, it's meant to be, you know, a lot of what uh, NRF52 is used on is small Bluetooth nodes and things like that. So it needs to be able to handle just working off a coin cell battery or a small battery. And uh, and then there's some crystals, there's a programming header here, uh, and then a bunch of flexible logic on the right side here. Um, so this is another thing that uh, I've gotten caught out before on uh, on chips where I thought we were using JTAG and it turned out it was actually SWD, which is single wire debug. That's been a, a problematic thing when we've worked together in the past too, right, Eric? Yeah, so um, a lot of the um, lower end ARM chips uh, to save uh, cost, so like a lot of the Cortex-M zero chips will mm -hmm. only support SWD. But then a lot of the, uh, like the M4s, M3s, M4s will support both JTAG and FWD. And really you can use either one of them. If you have a, a, a debugger like a J-Link, it will do either one mm -hmm. easily. The SWD is a little simpler because it only has a, a, a clock and a data line, whereas JTAG right. is uh, four, four lines. I always figured that the, uh, it was some, somewhat is like a bandwidth thing that you only have two lines for SWD of a clock and a data. And with JTAG, it's more like a spy where you have data in both directions and that kind of thing. So you get a little bit more bandwidth for debugging. Yeah, and um, I mean, I haven't really noticed the difference as far as uh, when you use the one versus the other as far as uh, debugging performance or ease of use. It's, it's pretty seamless. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, the lower end chips will only implement usually the SWD just to keep the 
the chip design it's a little simpler and cost effective mm -hmm. yeah so if we look at this uh so on the right side here so again this is a, a KiCad symbol so what it's showing here is it's showing all of the various inputs and outputs and oops um and so they're labeled p0 dot and then, then the then pin number so it's p0.17 is port 0 pin 7 or well port 0 .17, I suppose but there are two total ports is p0 and p1 um one thing i was careful to do so a lot of what this is um a lot of what i'm sending signals to is the expansion header right which is going to the daughter card so this is just a 50 pin header that has a bunch of signals going up to the to a a separate board right so it's a again this is a, that sandwich uh if we again for people listening it's gonna be a little harder to see but uh for people viewing it's uh basically it's just a uh it's a 50 pin 0 0.05 mil pit or 0 0.05 inch pitch uh uh connector here this black connector and the whole thing plugs together and basically the top board can then access all the signals on the bottom board uh and so a lot of what i'm doing is i'm sending these signals there because these are flexible signals uh, what I've done here is I've actually assigned some of them to be spy, but, uh, but I've been careful to look at the data sheet and, uh, well, for this time, at least <laughs> I've, uh, I've been careful to look at the data sheet and see what's actually available there. So Eric, if, if you saw, if I sent you a schematic like this and I, I had just randomly assigned, you know, S clock, MISO and MOSI, how would you go and then check that on the data sheet? Uh, you... Most uh, microcontroller data sheets have a, um, most of them call it alternate function. Okay. Uh, so any digital IO pin has, you know, GPIO functionality. And that's mm -hmm. usually kind of the default, you know, you see either input or output, high or low, pretty uh -huh. simple. Um, but then there'll, there'll be a table of alternate functions for each pin. So mm -hmm. say pin uh, zero, yeah, like zero nineteen there. Maybe it could be a spy clock, but it also could be a UART or um, uh, I two C clock pin. Mm -hmm. yep. But those are the it's only two functions. Yeah. Um, the but the Nordic, like we were saying, is pretty nice. Where for the most part, you can assign those peripheral functions to any pin. Now, one of the big exceptions there is some of those are analog capable and some are not. So I would say with a, using a Nordic like this, my first kind of constraint would be to identify any analog functionality I need, make sure that I use those pins uh, for on the use of analog, you have to use, you know, analog pins for your analog functionality, but then it, it, try to reserve some of those uh, if you have unused pins. So if you need to add analog functionality mm. for something later, you still have those. Whereas the digital, digital pin, digital only pins, um, those analog pins can also do the digital functionality. But then you, again, you gotta, you gotta look at that um, table in the data sheet to make sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And, and yeah, so these, uh, so P0.02 through 05, those are all analog inputs. And then there's another set of analog inputs. There's a total of eight, 0 0.28. And, and like Eric said, I was able to make these generic. So I just kept the same pin name when I, uh, when I'm assigning it to the header. And so basically those eight pins that are capable of being analog will all go up to the daughter card that is designed later. Um, and so basically if we need to swap on say pin 0 0.31, we could just say, Hey, you're an analog input now. And it will route that signal internally to the ADC and be able to handle that sort of thing. The uh, signal that Eric was mentioning, P0.0 uh, to, uh, sorry, 0 0.19, um, which was, uh, I had listed as S clock, which is part of the spy peripheral. Um, let's see, I was just, I usually just go and search through the data sheet here. Um, this one actually is listed as a general purpose IO. It's not listed. There's some that are listed as standard drive, low frequency IO only. So I was careful not to use any of those for a spy bus. And then there actually is a recommended usage column in the data sheet. And this one was the one that was QSPY or S clock. QSPY was something that is, I think that's like a higher speed version, right, Eric? Yeah, it's uh, the same as SPY, except uh, you have extra data lines so you can get more uh, bandwidth Got per it. each clock. Right. So if you're doing like a high speed transfer or something like that from a, a SPY memory or a SD card or something like that, you could you could basically get four bits of data instead of a single lane. That's kind of the idea. 
Yeah, and a lot of times what's that used for is um, program execution in external Flash. Ah, okay. Uh, so so you, it, you usually QSPY is fast enough to be able to do that and not um, significantly affect the performance of the chip as opposed to just using your internal Flash. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because that kind of goes back to the uh, bootloader idea you had earlier. So instead of instead of needing multiple sections in the Flash, you could then just program the next, the new program into QSPY or into a spy flash rather, and then run out of there. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, especially if you had like a um, board optimized uh, code or, or something like that. So you could program uh, different algorithms in, uh, for that specific board or series of boards uh, in that QSPY, but have your common application in the internal flash. So if you had That's two great. different variations of the same board, you could you could do it that way without having to have separate application builds. That's cool. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. And then you could basically uh, you could sell two or three or four SKUs of the same product without needing to build four four different board types, right? You just flick a switch and hey, it's a brand new product. You put a new coat of paint on it, and it's good to go. <laughs> yeah, because you could you could obviously do multiple, uh, you know have lots of if def statements and do mm -hmm. one code base for multiple uh, hardware uh, releases. But it's if you can keep it as simple, if you can, then mm -hmm. it makes your life a lot easier going forward, especially with maintenance and adding features later and doing things like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, so let's see. Let's go back to the data sheet and schematic here. Um, so other things that were on here, uh, I guess... Um, you know, some of the, the the top right corner here, it has the ability to do, uh, you know, GPIO or a secondary clock. And this is a 32.768 kilohertz crystal. What do you think of when you hear that, when you hear that magical number, Eric? Oh, yeah, that that is that is a magic number. Um, that's a real-time clock. So that's usually going to be used to generate a, a one-second uh, tick inside to keep track of your um, actual time. Uh, and a lot of times those have a separate battery power section. So that part of the, that section of the chip can always be on and always be running. So you power off, you can power off the most of the chip, but you're still keeping track of time. Mm -hmm. So when you come back on, uh, you know, you, you don't need like a network connection to try to figure out, okay, what time is it? You, you already have that. So for battery conscious designs, that, that can be very beneficial. Yeah, yeah, and that's also like when you see a, a coin cell on a on a board. I always think that oh, they've got a real time clock on there too, because that's just like they just kind of mm -hmm. pass it off to the coin cell, and that thing will go as many years that it's that coin cell is living, or sometimes they're even rechargeable. So it's a interesting interesting setup for those kind of things. So if we look at the uh, let's see the rest of the schematic. Uh, so the like I said, the top section is power up here. We've got uh, on the left side we've got an antenna, so that's obviously Bluetooth. We already talked about the programming, uh, which is a JTAG header going through Tag Connect. Uh, we've got a crystal, which is the main crystal. That's a eight megahertz crystal, I believe. And then, kind of everything else, I guess it has you know USB, USB C connection, or well, it's really just D plus D minus using it as a USB 2.0. What is your uh, experience with USB and and using that as a bootloader and or uh, you know an interface and and handling handling that sort of things with uh, Cortex M chips? Uh, well, it's pretty versatile, um, and it's it's pretty widely supported on a lot of different chips. So, well, kind of the simplest thing you can use it for is um, a, a UART connection um, to a, a PC. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's used quite a bit. Uh, a lot of times, uh, vendors will have uh, a DFU profile, which is a device firmware update. So you can use the USB uh, in conjunction with some kind of ROM code to be able to update a chip uh, from your computer. So mm. that that's pretty convenient. You don't have to have special hardware uh, that so you just you, know, you would just like you press and I button. probably have right. But, but it would just press somebody a else and it, go into that kind of mode or something like that. Right. Or a lot of times, yeah, you'll hold down a button on when you plug it in. Mm -hmm. And that'll that'll kick off this uh, update mode. Got it. Got it. That's great. That's great. 
uh, let's see. So um, I think that's kind of it here. So the other thing that is going between, so basically uh, we haven't talked anything about the cellular. So obviously you have a lot of experience in cellular modems and things like that. So that's actually a different sheet that we're going to be looking at here. Um, this is, so basically the BG95, EG91, they, they live in the 1.8 volt domain. And so we need to have a level translator, which basically allows 3.3 volt signals that the NRF52 is using to talk to the 1.8 volt signals. But then talking to the uh, BG95 or EG91, uh, that's all just talking over serial, right? So, or over UART. So what, is, what does that usually entail to talk between a microcontroller and an external modem like that? Yeah, the most common interface to a modem is still with a serial port and using something called AT commands. Back in the olden days when you actually had a dial-up modem, you know, you would type in ATDT and a phone number to talk to make a connection to another computer. Wow. And that uh, kind of the same, same, yeah, same serial interface is, is still the main uh, way you'd use a um, modem module like that with a microcontroller. Um, they do offer USB interfaces now, but usually those are targeted more towards uh, full-featured platforms like Linux or, or Windows, where they have drivers that run on the host machine to uh, to talk to the modem that way. But if, if you're using a microcontroller, you're usually going to send serial AT commands, uh, which is um, uh, on the surface seems simple, but as you dig into it, it it can be quite complex because it's not really deterministic as far as it, it's not a simple state machine to, to handle sending and receiving the sending AT commands and all the possible responses and uh, kind of spontaneous messages, asynchronous messages that the modem can send you say like you had, you get a text message, right? You can, you, at any time you could have this uh, uh, input stream pop up about alerting you to, you know, a text message or a change in your uh, connection or something like that. So you need to be able to handle not just here's my command and here's the response I expect, but you, the modem could also be sending you other stuff too. And so mm -hmm. you, your code has to be smart enough to be able to handle all that. Right. And yeah, and handling with serial in the first place, it's like, it's, it's human readable, which is really nice. Uh, but, but the downside being that like machines don't, you know, dealing with strings and C and, dealing with, you know, these longer, you know, basically you have to then go and capture and say, oh, it's AT plus something. And then there's some data value that's with it as well. It's just, it's not, it doesn't seem as, as succinct or as likely that a microcontroller would be communicating like that. Yeah. So, so there are challenges as far as, as doing that. And just, you know, if you're writing something like that from scratch, just uh, having a, um, UART driver that will uh, buffer all that data, uh, so you don't so you don't miss bytes coming in oh, from yeah. the modem. Right. I mean that's that's critical, right? Because if right. you if you missed one byte in the in the midst, there's no um, checksumming yeah, or so retries like TCP uh, with AT commands. Like yeah, yeah, it's AT plus something, and then it ends in uh, carriage return line feed. And so if you miss a you know a line feed, you're you're in big trouble. Yeah. You, you're way out of sync with the modem. You basically have to start mm -hmm. over. So that kind of stuff is critical. And then being able to parse and the, the, the format of what comes back from the modem, each command might do it a little bit differently. Uh -huh. So there, there's, there's several different command uh, res response formats that it could, could send. So mm -hmm. you have to be able to handle any of those depending on what command you're sending. Got it. Yeah. 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 And I mean, so then if, when you're dealing with the actual modem itself, is it pretty self-contained? I mean, so, so we talked about the Bluetooth, it kind of runs on its own, it does its own thing. And you just kind of send commands and get commands. Is, is it similar in that way that you are just kind of, you send something to the modem, it does its thing, and then maybe it gets a response back or, or how much interaction is there when you're talking between a, a micro and a, and a modem like that? Uh, so initially, there's a lot of message exchange to set up the connection, make sure you have a signal, make sure you want check your connection state, and uh, kind of conf get that modem configured in the in the right state for your whatever network you're going to be on. Uh, so there's there's a, usually a, a kind of boilerplate uh, sequence of commands that you need to do to get it configured. 
and that, but that's going to vary a little bit from modem to modem depending on the model and what what it does in its specific command set. And the other thing you uh, it's kind of you have to look out for as far as what modem you're using, different vendors. So there there's there's some common um, commands that all pretty much all modems are going to support, but then there's vendor specific commands to be able to do uh, features specific to that modem. And they use their own uh, kind of command prefixing. Pre prefixing. Uh, so like a uBlocks modem is going to have built-in uh, command, AT commands uh, to do things like socket operations, or if it has GPS, GPS operations. And then a, a Quicktel will have kind of similar commands, but formatted in their own way and and so you have to, so the more modems, if you want to support multiple modems, you have to be able to speak that modem's language. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And dealing with individual modems as well, I was thinking there's other, there's other quirks about this as well, right? The, I was thinking the uh, like reset stuff, you know, like this is another thing that caught, uh, caught me out on a past one where like the reset, it actually requires like an inverter in front of it. And so, you know, you expect like, you know, when a reset end pin is like this, but it's like, Oh, it's actually expecting a push button, so you have to emulate a push button by putting in a, a, a inverter and stuff like this. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of times the modems to power on, you'll need to do a pulse uh, based on an output voltage that the the modem itself generates, mm -hmm. uh, and it needs to be of a at least a certain duration to get the modem from like a, a standby state to an active state. Right. And each and again, that's one of those things that's specific to each modem. Yeah. And the other uh, another thing I know that from the hardware perspective, the um, supply voltage mm -hmm. for a modem is usually not three point three or five, which we're in the microcontroller world we're very used to, but it's somewhere in between, like in in the three point eight to four point two kind of a kind of right. range. Yeah, yeah, it's been interesting looking at that more. That's actually tied to the fact that usually, you know, modems are usually meant for batteries, right? And batteries are usually lithium ion or similar, and they go from 4.2 volts down to 3.5. Or, and so really that 3.8 volt number is kind of like the average, and it's really where the, the curve of uh, uh, lithium ion lives for like 80% of its lifespan. So that's kind of what it's based on. And so on this design, actually, we're, we're using, uh, we're actually not regulating the battery. It's, it's using, it's assuming there's a battery on board, but then the specific part that is in here, uh, this is the BQ25000 series, uh, it actually can output a voltage regardless of whether a battery's in there as well. So it's got a switcher built into the battery charge management uh, system. And, um, and uh, this thing can actually uh, output enough to charge the battery, but when the battery's not there, it'll still output to 3.3 volts. And it also can power crazy stuff. Like it can actually go and back power the Raspberry Pi, which is also kind of interesting uh a downside to this of course is that you need to control it with a i squared c bus and and uh and it's got interrupts and you know basically the there's like a tiny state machine that lives inside of the power management controller which is not something you would normally expect but then you have to set that up and have that ready to go so so yeah lots of fun challenges there as well So in terms of other uh, other characteristics that are things that you would normally check in a design, I mean, uh, so we talked through some of the uh, some of the Bluetooth things and some of the, uh, you know, the, obviously we have a lot of flexible logic here. So that's that's a nice thing. I mean, are there other kind of gotchas that you usually go and check for before? Uh, well, well, one thing specific to the modem, and then um, this, is, this can be kind of a general issue too, is the IO voltage of a modem is usually 1.8 at least mm -hmm. most most of the ones i've seen are 1.8 volts mm -hmm. um and they will are not tolerant of anything much higher than 1.8 volts so if yep. you try to drive a input to the modem with your with a 3.3 volt output from a microcontroller um you may have a, a, a one-time time. use modem there <laughs> yeah not yeah. not fun to do one-time use on modems so that's um, right yeah they're not cheap either so that and and that's not you know uh, specifically just to modems. Any peripheral um, you choose, you have to you have to watch and, and make sure that uh, your microcontroller voltage is uh, 
going to be compatible with your peripheral uh, voltages. And sometimes that your life is pretty easy. Like you'll have a, uh, maybe you'll have a sensor that is, um, that will work anywhere from 3.3 to 1.8, just fine. So it doesn't matter. You hook it up and you're fine. Um, sometimes you'll have uh, like maybe a, a sensor. I've had sensors where they need five volts to run and they have five volt IO mm -hmm. and your microcontroller is 3.3 volts. Um, Sometimes you'll find you'll be able to find a microcontroller that has that will run at 3.3 volts as its core voltage, uh, but have its input pins be five volt tolerant. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, so you and usually that uh, that 3.3 volt output is enough to tr to be a high voltage to your peripheral, even yeah. if it's at five volts. But if that five volts coming back won't damage your microcontroller, so yeah. that that's pr it's pretty handy. Otherwise, you need to do. Uh, voltage level translators and that is a, you know one more piece of complexity in your yeah. io and uh, definitely a something to consider as far as uh power usage sure because when sure. you have those mismatches of voltages i know we went that was one of the um problems we had trying to get uh lowest power usage on um, the dash mm. was that we had a voltage uh translator and the uh, to the modem to be able to do the 3.3 to 1.8 volt conversion. Uh, and the way that it was originally uh, laid out, when the modem turned off, that 1.8 volts was also turned off. Uh, but if the microcontroller was still running, a, the 3.3 volts was feeding into that um, voltage translator and, and nothing on the other side, it was, try, it was trying to match voltages to zero and it was burning a lot of power doing nothing. So we had to end up uh, doing using some uh, enables and cutoffs to be able to make sure that that uh, translator chip wasn't running when the modem was off. Yeah, that's a great tip actually. And I'm looking at the so I'm looking at the level translator that I have here, the uh, TXS 0108, which is the recommended one from QuickTel. And uh, yeah, I just have the output enable hooked to uh, to ground, so it's always on. So I should definitely send that as a signal uh, to. Uh, uh, to the actual micro so that it can go and actually turn that off, huh? Something like that. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, there's a few different ways you can design it, whether um, you're using, like, switches that detect um, uh, if, you, if you have uh, voltage coming from one side or the other, mm -hmm. or if you, you know, it may be more appropriate for the microcontroller to have direct control Mm -hmm. Yeah, and only only enable that voltage converter when you're you're ready to talk to the modem. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, that's great. I will definitely tie that in here, and uh, yeah, this is this has been good. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, I'm pretty excited to to move this design forward. I mean, are there other other general thoughts or other things you generally think about uh, as you're as you're moving designs forward? Other things you test maybe maybe in the bring up stage things that have caught you up during bring up that would have been uh, helpful in the hardware stage like test points or, or similar things like that yeah uh yeah if you go back to the schematic one thing you always want to be clear about and you usually you're usually actually pretty good on on this from uh designs i've seen from you is anytime you have a, a bi-directional communication like with a uart yeah. If you just use a label like TX, <laughs> yeah. uh, you're asking you're asking for problems because um, I don't know. There's there's probably a law named after someone for this, but you, it'll be wrong. Uh, yeah, that's right. It'll be it'll be it'll be backwards from what you think it is. Yep. So uh, modems used to use like DTE and DCE terminology as far as who is TX and who's mm -hmm. RX and. Yeah, so you were talking about board bring up for the first mm -hmm. time, and yeah, that's yeah. always a, a challenge because you really never know what uh, what you're going to find. Um, my usual process uh, for doing development of a new design is uh, you don't want to wait until the hardware is uh, completed and delivered before you start your software development because that that's uh, that, that stretches the process out quite a bit. So. I'll, my usual process is to find some sort of development kit that is either the same microcontroller or, you know, very similar. 
and kind of start the software design there to at least get the structure in place, figure out, you know, what drivers I need for what components. And you, you can have, you can really do maybe, depending on how many of your components you can get as like maybe breakout boards or uh, things you can just kind of fake in the interim, you can get maybe 80% of your software design done before the hardware is even uh, delivered. And then you can focus on, all right, let's, let's make sure this works on the target hardware and get those last few things working. Right. Um, so, so if you start from that perspective, so you've already tested out a lot of your, your software before the hardware, because you, if you have, you're writing brand new code on brand new hardware, uh, it's not always clear who made the mistake initially, if you haven't proven out some of that firmware first. So, I could be. Well, there's always Chris, lots of finger, you, finger, finger pointing, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Why did Why did you do this? Oh, yeah. well, I actually didn't write that yeah. register correctly. Oh, that was software. Oh, sorry about right. that. Right. Yeah. You yeah. Would try to yeah. avoid that before you uh, antagonize your hardware uh, <laughs> colleagues. Uh, no, I think that's good. Make too sure because, it's not you first. Yeah. Well, and then you have like a a known good, right? You're just like, hey, it's not like, hey, I wrote this code. It should be working. It's like, no, no, I wrote this code and it is working right here. I can show you with the development board let's compare and contrast. And then that is super helpful for then the debugging process of the hardware and then finding out that, yeah, Chris hooked up the RXTX backwards or something like that. Yeah, it really is, but it's not foolproof. Mm. Uh, I had a situation where I had a, a dev kit board that used a similar, but not the exact same microcontroller. Oh. And one of the, the IOs was an, uh, that I was using, well, I'm trying to remember which way it was, but on one, it was an analog, and the other one, it wasn't. Oh. And it was default in analog mode. And I hadn't changed it explicitly to digital mode because it was that pin was default digital mode. But once I uh, went on the target board, I think that's what it was, that mm -hmm. pin was default analog mode, so the digital functions didn't work. Yeah. And it, that was that's one of those where, you know, double-check the data sheet, especially if you're moving between similar but not exactly the same parts, make sure, oh, what are the differences? What are the gotchas between between these two between these two parts? Yeah, that's really good advice. Well, Eric, this has been uh, really insightful, and I always appreciate working with you. I think it's been, I've learned so much from you, uh, just from our chats and our checks and just, you know, going back and forth and troubleshooting together. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, we're... Yeah, really, the uh, hardware software collaboration in embedded systems, I, I think it's it's really unique because you uh, to be a good firmware developer, you need to under at least understand what the hardware is doing and and what the needs of the hardware designer are and the some of the constraints there. And I think it makes you a better hardware designer when you understand, oh, this is what's important to a firmware developer that you m wouldn't necessarily think about. Uh, in a vacuum. So yep. It's good totally. to have that back and forth interaction. Yeah, definitely. Where can people find out more about you? And if they are looking for a firmware person, where can they go to hire you? Uh, so I uh, have been doing uh, contract uh, soft firmware development for more than 10 years now, uh, but for the most part remotely. Uh, my uh, consulting company is called Statropy Software, which in retrospect was a terrible name. Uh, and I know this because every time I go to the bank, I hear a different pronunciation of my company. I but, when you I'm, know, when I'm was, trying to like freehand type your email and I'm always like, strat, yes. strat, Stratopy? Yeah, strat, I know. Strat, was, strategy? Strat, no. <laughs> but I, I've stuck with it this long, so I'm yeah, just going to. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's unique. That's, that's People will remember it eventually. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe. And it's uh, s t a t r o p y dot com, and that that's uh, you can you can get a hold of me there, and uh, you, you can see that I'm not a web designer. I'm a uh, embedded <laughs> embedded yeah. software developer. Yeah, that's right, so right. <laughs> no confusion there. Um, but uh, but yeah, I uh, I I can I take taken on all kinds of different embedded firmware uh, projects on you know lots of different industries, lots of different use cases. So. Uh, that's really, you know, I could, I can do a lot of different programming, like a lot of different different things. But this is really what I, I'm passionate about and, and love to do. Just for the, there's there's just something different about it. The hardware uh, interaction, the, mm -hmm. you know, you write code and 
It's it still excites me to write some code and then see an LED blink. That, hey, I, I, I still get a, I still get a charge out of that. They're like, oh, you get you get the definite tactile feedback on yeah, on what yeah you changing do. changing your environment is a powerful thing. I think. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today, and uh, we'll, I'm I'm going to be reviewing this again with you soon. I'm sure. All right. Thanks, Chris. So that was our show with Eric, and it was really great to talk to him about his feedback about the schematic and really just to get his background on firmware and working in the industry, the stuff about punch cards, right? I mean, like, that's amazing that he had, he had been working with people that were doing that. This is the third episode of the Contextual Electronics Podcast. We are really hoping that you will consider to go and give it an iTunes review that really helps for people to go and find the show. And since we're a brand new podcast, we're obviously releasing all three episodes up front, but we are hoping to be found by more people. And so if you're willing to, please go give us a review. Honesty is the best policy. Don't We don't care about what you write there, but please do let us know what you think. If you have other f- feedback that is not for an iTunes review and you just want to tell us, hey, I really like this, but I'd prefer to see this in the future, you can always send an email to podcast at contextualelectronics.com or you can leave comments either on YouTube or in the blog post that goes along with this post. If you'd like to follow us in other places, uh, my Twitter handle is Chris underscore Gamel. And Contextual Electronics has a Twitter handle as well. It's Contextual Electra. We ran out of characters, so uh, yeah, we'll have the link for that in the show notes as well. Uh, and like I said, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love for you to share, and uh, we'd love for you to come back. We already have a couple more episodes recorded, and we will be releasing them weekly, video and audio. And uh, we're really excited about doing more stuff in the future. That's all for now. We'll see you in the next episode of the Contextual Electronics Podcast.